Hello and welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. Kay Marie and Ali Moreno here with you in the studio. And the speculation continues over Cristiano Ronaldo's future. In fact, he didn't turn up to training on Monday with Manchester United. The club did know about it. They gave him permission not to. But the subject of his future has been something that Mark Ogden has written oh. about for ESPN.com, saying there has been a constant sense behind the scenes at United this summer that Ronaldo was waiting for the right moment to push for a move and that there would be few, uh, few tears shed in the dressing room if he chose to leave, pointing to tensions within the squad centred around Ronaldo and his demanding personality. Nobody comes out of this situation well. Ronaldo should have made his intentions clear at the end of last season. But United and Ten Hag have also had opportunities to force the issue and deal with it much sooner. But one thing is certain, Ronaldo's time at United is off. Uh-oh. Well, good job that we do have Mark Ogden Hi. with us right now, along with Craig Burley and Ian Dark as well. So I will start with you, Mark. What does this tell us about Cristiano Ronaldo's future and where's he going? Well, as a, as a kind of a public uh, stance by United, and that is that he's not for sale, but the, the reality behind the scenes is there's an acceptance that they can't really hold him against his will, especially a player like Ronaldo, whose profile is so high that the last thing they, they want this season, this summer, is a massive distraction, and, and that's what he's created. So they'll try and find a buyer, but it's going to be so difficult. He earns at least half a million pound a week. He's 37. They might want a transfer fee. So the, 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 the queue of clubs is quite small. You're looking at... Chelsea are interested, Napoli are interested, Bayern Munich may be interested and I've been told that United don't want to sell to a Premier League club so that narrows down the options even further but you know he hasn't returned to training today, it was his first day back at pre-season or supposed to be, he's still in Portugal, uh, family reasons are the reasons that have been given, the club have accepted that but there's now a real question mark over whether he will go to Thailand and Australia this week on the club's tour. Now. They're away for two and a half weeks. If there are family issues that Ronaldo has to settle, I, I can't see him going to Thailand and Australia for two and a half weeks because it's the other side of the world. There's you know time difference issues. There's there's detachment from the family. For me, it's just it's just the, the worst possible scenario for Eric Ten Hag. It's his first week properly in the job because all his players are around. He's got to go to the Far East this week and feel questions nonstop about Ronaldo. It's it's just it's the it's the Man United circus is back now. I remember 2013 David Moyes only season in charge, only pre-season in charge. I went to I went to Thailand and Australia the same summer and his biggest player wanted to leave, Wayne Rooney wanted to leave. And every day we were getting up in, in Thailand and Australia with news breaking back home about Chelsea being in for Rooney, Rooney wanted to leave. And it was a constant distraction on, on a massive summer for David Moyes. And it turned out to be a distraction that derailed the team going forward. This could happen again with Ten Hag and this is Ronaldo for me, has, has left it so late, he's given United a massive problem. Craig, you've been good at identifying where the circuses are in football right now. Does this continue the circus at Manchester United? Well, not really. We have a player who... Let's address the, one of the points in Augie's uh, column uh, that, that sort of mentioned there will be few tears shed in the dressing room if Ronaldo leaves. Really? I mean, trust me, the only tears been shed are by the fans at the fact that half of these wannabes are actually at the club and should be. The fact that he was allegedly a little bit divisive last year on arrival at the club, I think it's merely down to the fact that the standards were awful. The quality was awful. The attitudes were awful. And so I can understand that frustration. The other side of the coin is uh, I think United have to get him out. We obviously know he's not the future. Uh, I believe the player has said his management will work with clubs in terms of a potential reduction in wages. But Eric Ten Hag, to go back to Augie's point, you can't have a bad apple, a divisive player, and one that doesn't want to be there in the dressing room between now and the start of the season with new management, trying to build some new foundations... You can't have that player, an ordinary player, never mind a divisive superstar who doesn't want to be at the club. So they're going to have to find a way and his management's going to have to find a way to get him out of that club. Clearly, he's worked out that, you know, the next couple of years are going to be tough, at least, and they're not going to be challenging. By that time, he'll be 39. He's not going to be playing to that standard. He's just not. 
And so I think it's understandable that he wants to go. The biggest mistake he made, I think, was was thinking that he was walking back into a club uh, 12 months ago that was moving forward. When clearly on this show, and many, many of us talked about it, they had the wrong manager and they were nowhere near challenging to Liverpool and Manchester City. So, so yeah, this is a problem for Ten Hag short term. But as Mark said, he doesn't need the next two months to be talking about Ronaldo. They need to find a solution and I honestly think the solution is to get him out sooner rather than later. What are your thoughts on it all, Ian? Well, it's a bit like that old Coldplay lyric, isn't it? Is he part of the cure or part of the disease at Manchester United? He did score 24 goals, 18 in the Premier League. Only a couple of players bettered that. But he can't play high press. So Manchester United can't play a high press with Cristiano Ronaldo. Ten Hag will want to do that. I mean, the guys are right. They've got to find a very quick solution. He obviously does want out of Manchester United. But as Oggy says, who's going to buy him? Half a million pound a week, 37 years old, little bit of baggage, divisive in the dressing room, apparently. So there are not going to be that many takers, really. So whatever it is, they need to do the deal quickly and find another striker who can score that amount of goals unless they're hoping that Marcus Rashford who we've been hearing has been doing all this fitness training on his own in the summer is going to come back a new man and rediscover his goal touch at the moment you'd have to say that seems a bit unlikely but uh, you know Ten Hag knew this was going to be tough <laughs> it's looking even tougher already uh, the club's mentioned as part of his future Chelsea Bayern and even Napoli mm. where would be the best place out of those clubs for Cristiano Ronaldo LA? Well, potentially Chelsea, but that's not going to happen because Manchester United, even though they haven't made most of the correct decisions over the last few years, you would assume that they wouldn't just let Cristiano Ronaldo walk into Chelsea and then be a direct competitor to Manchester United. Uh, Bayern Munich, but does that really make sense for Bayern Munich? Because you're, you're having a situation right now with Robert Lewandowski. And... Quite frankly, at this point in their careers, I'd rather have Robert Lewandowski scoring goals for me than Cristiano Ronaldo. So it doesn't quite make sense from that sort of from that point of view. I actually think from Ten Hag, quietly, he won't say this publicly, but quietly, this is something that would be ideal for Cristiano Ronaldo to just go on his own. So that he doesn't have to make that decision. Because long term. Cristiano Ronaldo is not part of the plans. In the short term, he may be able to help you to score a few goals because you don't have anybody else to score those goals. But in the long term and the big picture from Ten Hag, as he's starting his project, he doesn't want the shadow of Cristiano Ronaldo looming all over him and all over this locker room. And by the way, just as a side note about this locker room that apparently uh, was divisive or divided by Cristiano Ronaldo because of his expectations of the players or whatever he demanded of the players. It only serves to confirm whatever perception we had of this locker room being soft, touchy, very sensitive. Guess what? Cristiano Ronaldo walked in here into this locker room and became automatically the best player in that team and continue to be the best player in that team. And even at 37, we're still having the conversation, man, should we hang on to Cristiano Ronaldo or not? Because you're looking around and you're saying, uh, nobody else is good enough to score the goals here. Nobody else is good enough to carry that pressure. So as much as you want to complain about Cristiano Ronaldo in the locker room, he was producing. The rest of the guys were not. What do you think, Craig? If he is to leave United, where's the best fit? Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Somebody who's looking for a very short-term solution at a, at a hefty price. I don't think it's about getting a transfer fee for him now. I think it's about getting them out, getting the deal done, freeing up the wages, freeing up the dressing room, uh, taking that weight off the manager's shoulders. Because if he does stay, you know, it's not just going to be the next six weeks to the season starts. It's going to be every poor performance. It's going to be, is he playing this week? Is he on the bench? Is he happy? It's going to be every day. So I, I think, you know, I, I, and I can understand from, from both perspectives here, but I think from United's point of view, listen, there's a hell of a big broom that has to sweep this clean and he's got to have to go out with, it and, uh, with the rest of them. And I know there's nobody short term to score the goals, but they're going to have to figure that out. They're going to have to go through this pain 
to get to the end line. And it's their, it's their problem. It was their recruitment drive that caused all this, and they're going to have to deal with it. But as I say, he realised he's made a mistake. Forget all the nostalgia about this was the club when he was brilliant. That was David Gill and Alec Ferguson. This isn't this isn't the same club. This isn't the same team. This isn't the same ownership. Things have changed. He's walked in there and he's thought, sod this. Unprofessional players. Going to take a long time to rebuild it. I'm 37. i got to get out there and play. So somewhere short term with a World Cup coming up, I suppose. Might be Chelsea, might be... I don't know if United want to... I'm sure they don't want to sell to a rival, but I think in some sense they've got to be bigger than that. They're not fighting for a title. They've got to see the bigger picture and start rebuilding this squad. Uh, Ian, do you like Cristiano Ronaldo to Chelsea? I don't think they should be too fussy about it. I mean, worrying about selling him to a rival, if they don't want him around, I think they just have to get him off the books and get a new striker in. So if it's Chelsea and Chelsea's the only game in town, if it comes to Cristiano Ronaldo, yep, do it. OK, nice. Well, Christian Eriksen has agreed to move to Manchester United. It's a three-year deal that they're looking at at the moment for the 30-year-old. And just taking a look at everything that we've seen from him of late and obviously most recently with Brentford. What more can you tell us about this move, Mark? Well, I had felt quite confident by the end of last week that Eriksen would come. And it just basically boiled down to whether he wanted to play every week at Brentford and have a, you know, the, the guys had a, a traumatic experience the last one once he made us wanted to play at his career with no pressure at Brentford or whether he wanted that extra that extra buzz, that extra challenge of going to Man United. And I think Ericsson had to think long and hard about it, whether he wanted to go to United and, and play fewer games, play with more pressure. But he's taken out because obviously Ericsson's a big time player, play for, you know, play for Tottenham, play for Inter, play for Ajax. He's a guy that is used to spending his career at the top end of the, of the game. So He's ultimately thought over the weekend to think about what to do. He's decided that he's young enough and he's still got enough football in him to, to take the chance to go to United. Now, the guys are right. The United's in a mess right now. And, you know, who knows how long it'll take to get them back. But if you're playing for Brentford and you've got a chance to go to Man United, no matter what state Man United are in, you go to Man United because they are one of the biggest clubs in the world, even if they are quite dysfunctional right now. And I just want to make one very quick point that the, the, the guys have raised about the, the, the divisive dressing room. I think that the, the Ronaldo was divisive for the right reasons. He shone a light on the the failures and the deficiencies of the squad that was there. He challenged people that nobody else had challenged before. He, the, the, the culture had become too soft and Ronaldo was, was, was challenging that to become different. That's why he wasn't liked. That's why a lot of the players were will be happy to see the back of him. And that, that again, is an indictment of Man United right now. But they have to move on, like the guys say. And Ericsson is part of that moving on. You know, I'm sure they brought Ericsson in knowing that Ronaldo might want to leave. And Ericsson and others, you know, Anthony Ajax is another target they want to bring in, will hopefully, from United's point of view, help plug the gap. But, you know, they're not going to sign a centre-forward right now that's going to score 30 goals a season because they've missed all the best ones. Craig, do you like Ericsson to United? And where will he fit? Oh, I, love, I, love, I honestly love this bit of business. You know, 12 months ago, this guy almost lost his life on a, on a football field. Uh, so, you know, thankfully, as we watched the live pictures on that occasion, he managed to, to come back and be healthy and left Milan, uh, left Inter and, and got game time at Brentford. And if you watched him last year, you know, in a very tidy Brentford side, he still has a lot of quality. He can still play. Set pieces are magnificent. He can change a game. There's no transfer fee. I'm sure he's not on the biggest of wages. He knows, as Mark said, he's going to play less games, but he will play games. And, you know, is another alternative, you know, on the one of the wider positions, if, if need be in a certain system. And the number 10 role, if Bruno Fernandes is, is out of form or being petulant or whatever, this guy can come in and pick a pass. So it's not just about signing. And I've heard one or two people in the UK say, oh, hey, this is underwhelming. Oh, man, you... Look, you can't sign 10 Kylian Mbappes or Alfie Engel Haaland or Ronaldo's. You can't, it can't all be big stars. You need to beef your squad up with good quality players. And that's what this guy is. And I think Augie's right. You know, bearing in mind what happened to him uh, last summer, to have the opportunity now to go and play for a club as big as Man United, albeit as a challenge, I think is brilliant business all round. Uh, Craig mentioned his versatility there, Ian, but can you see him actually playing in the same side, the same starting eleven as Bruno Fernandes? 
Well, you've got to think about Frankie de Jong if he's coming as well. So it could be a very new look midfield for Manchester United. I mean, they're all good players, aren't they? Christian Eriksen, yeah, I, I, he's a miracle man. It's a miracle story that he's done what he's done. I think it's a bit of a shame, you know, and I'm probably being a little bit sentimental here in saying that he can't give a few more months to Brentford because they were the club that took a chance on him. But he did his job for them. He kept them up because they were on the slide and looking in danger when he came in and he changed things around. He's still got all his class. He's a very, very good, classy player. And I think he'll start most weeks. He's too good to be sitting around on anybody's bench. And I think this the is... other thing is, I think, sorry, Ali, I think that just briefly, the other thing is, is we talked about the problems in the dressing room. I don't ever remember Ericsson, you know, at Tottenham or Inter or wherever, really been too many given too many problems. So I think the upside is is that, you know, whilst he might not be happy if he doesn't play, I think he's well known as been an extremely good professional as well. So it's 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 quality on the field and less problems off the field. And given where Christian Eriksen was a year ago, you know for certain that he's not taking anything for granted, which is what is happening a lot and with many players in Manchester United that there's a sense of entitlement, that they, they belong in Manchester United just because of their name. And because they're in Manchester United, then they're entitled to everything to come their way. Christian Eriksen, I think, and I have to imagine, gain a whole lot of perspective from where he has been, where he is, and where he will be. That perspective allows you to every day show up and be thankful that you have the opportunity to continue to do what you're doing. That's an example that the other players in that locker room should be able to follow. And uh, as we just heard Ian mentioning Frankie de Jong as well there, Mark, is he still in the plans then for Manchester United with Ericsson coming in? Yeah, absolutely. You know, United, again, are fairly confident about de Jong. They, they feel that they've come to some close an agreement with Barcelona, despite Juan Laporta's words at the weekend. That came across as a bit of a bluff that United aren't really buying right now but it does boil down to persuading De Jong that United is the right move but there is a confidence there that the deal will get done it'll just take a little bit more time I think the only the only concern was, would be that United may be a little bit overloaded in attacking midfield they still haven't really solved the problem which needs addressing of, of you know the guys in front of the defence you know Scott McTominay and Fred are all they've got Matt Matic has signed for Roma today so I think that I don't think De Jong is the answer there but he's a great player but that would be my only concern that Eriksen and De Jong are the top end of the pitch where they really need to start looking at the defensive end of the pitch to address the problems they had last season. I think it would be interesting to see if he would even ever consider playing the three of them together, Bruno Fernandes, Christian Eriksen and Frankie De Jong. Uh, well, I hope he, not. If he wants relegated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope not. That mix does not work. There's no defending going on there, I'm going to tell you that much. All right, let's move on to talk about Gabriel Jesus to Arsenal then as we continue to talk about transfers. This one that is actually done right now. Uh, he has been confirmed, but we want to talk a little bit about how he fits in this team. Does he make much more sense at Arsenal out on the right wing than in a number nine role, Ian? Um, I think he's, he should be played in, in the number nine role myself. Um, you look at his goal-scoring stats, they're pretty impressive, really, considering he doesn't get that many minutes for Manchester City. When he does play, he tends to pop up with, with goals. All right, he might not have the same level of creativity around him at Arsenal as he did at Manchester City, but I think at the price, is a pretty good deal uh, for Arsenal. And, of course, they have the choice. They can use him in a wide position, but I think he's pretty effective centrally. What do you think about his position, Craig, especially now that he's at Arsenal? I'm intrigued to see how he plays, as he'll be uh, a much bigger fish in that pond. Uh, and it's up to him to go and, and continue the attitude I think he's always shown, certainly in his time in England, which has been first class on the field, fighting and battling, and now he's going to be one of the main men. Uh, so I'm intrigued. I, I'm also... this. This is very 2022, isn't it? Carrying on from last year. That this sort of fit in narrative sort of drives me nuts. You know, even going back to the Lukaku at Chelsea, well, the system, well, he scored 15 goals. You know, it didn't work out because he had his head up his backside. It's not about fitting in, is it? Chelsea don't put crosses into the box. So, if they, I mean, these players will fit in. Good players will fit in with other good players. It's not. 
It's not rocket science. The, the field hasn't changed size. It's not 15 players now instead of 11. It, it, they'll, they'll fit in. You make it work. Good players make it work. And I don't really see it as an issue. If Arsenal have a bad season, the chances are Gabriel Jesus will have a pretty average season. But if they're creating chances and Smith Rowe and Martinelli and Odegaard and young Saka, they continue this sort of meteoric rise of the last 12 to 18 months, then he'll, he'll get service. But it just seems every... I mean, even Erling Haaland going to Man City, all I heard was, well, will he fit into that system? Oh, for goodness sake. Goodness sake. What do you mean will he fit in? What utter nonsense. So good players will fit in. And if Gabriel Jesus does not cut the muster to Arsenal. It's not because of Mikel Arteta, <coughs> excuse me, and it's not because he hasn't fitted into a system. Players make it work. If he doesn't if he doesn't make it work and cut the mustard, then he's just not been able to do it. I wonder if I can fit in any more questions about fitting in on tonight's no. show here on ESPN. What about system? <laughs> system. I think if you fit into system, that's... There's a few more of those coming up. How will Lionel Messi fit into PSG? <laughs> well, no, he's just not playing particularly well. It's not about fitting in. <laughs> Gabby Jesus, Arsenal. Will he fit in? <laughs> <laughs> what about the system? Look, I, um, I like Gabriel Jesus in Manchester City. But at Manchester City, he wasn't asked to be the main goal scorer. When he pitched in with goals, it was important for Manchester City because it was almost scoring by committee. Now at Arsenal, he is going to be given the keys to the car and say, Gabriel Jesus, you, my friend, have to be the guy who scores the goals for us. You are now responsible for carrying that load. We haven't seen Gabriel Jesus in that role. Now, I think for Arsenal, it's a good get, it's a good signing. But we are yet to see whether Gabriel Jesus is capable of doing that consistently. He has scored goals for Manchester City. Can he do it consistently for Arsenal? That'll be a big question. And, of course, it depends whether he fits in the system or not. Yeah, it does matter whether he does fit in. <laughs> Speaking about players who are going to have to find a way to fit in, Calvin Phillips is on his way to Manchester City. This has been made official, signed for £42 million plus well, it, £3 million well, in add-ons. Well, he won't have to find a way to fit in, K. He'll just need, he'll just need to find a way to get in. <laughs> well, yes, is it going to be Rodri's understudy then, Craig? Well... Fernandinho's not there anymore, and Fernandinho has been and was at Man City a, a magnificent player. I mean, even into his mid 30s, you know, just so dynamic, uh, even playing centre half and fullback uh, at times last year. But, you know, Rodri's come in, and I think he's been, he's been brilliant. Uh, if, if there's one sort of more defensive midfielder, yeah, it's going to be tougher for Phillips, but it's a chance for, for Guardiola to rotate again. He may play both at times. I don't think he'll need to, per se, in the Premier League, where they'll bludgeon most of the teams, along with Liverpool. <clears throat> but maybe in the big European games, there's a, there's a place maybe for a couple of them. And, of course, Bernardo Silva's made it clear that our, our sort of muddied the waters a little bit in terms of his future. So yeah, things could change. When I think Calvin Phillips is a... A terrific player, but it's a big step going to Man City um, and fitting in. I'm sorry, and getting in there. Ask, uh, I'm not saying those words. Uh, ask Jack Grealish. Ask okay, Jack Grealish well, about it. I want to go to Mark on this because obviously Erling Haaland's come in, as we can see there. Have there been any rumblings around Manchester, Mark, that Pep may change formations to fit some of these players in? <laughs> Yeah, I think he's scratching his head to fit all these in all the time, isn't it? No, listen, Pep just does what he does. It, he's got so many players in the same position, but they all fit in. They all, they all kind of, there's a, there's a front six and they all move around and rotate around. <laughs> I don't, you know, will he have to change things for, for Erling Haaland? I don't think so. I just think you play to Erling Haaland's strengths and you, you get the ball to him quickly and he'll, he'll run at defenders or you can get to the byline cross and he'll be there tapping it in the six-yard box. So, like, like Craig says, you know, great players just fit in, don't they? Oh no, I wish they hadn't brought this up, Oggy. Okay. Ian, just don't say, just don't say fit in. T -t Tell <laughs> us what you think it. about this move. Well, I think it's interesting for Calvin Phillips because you've got the World Cup coming up in the middle of November, so he'll want lots of minutes and to be pretty much centre stage playing for Manchester City. But I don't think he's going to get in the team for the biggest games because Rodri 
is the defensive midfield player, the number one. He's been in excellent form. I don't see Phillips getting past him. So I think the only way he plays is if they go with two number sixes in front of the defence, which, as Craig says, they might do for certain tough European games, but not very many. So I just wonder if he's going to spend quite a lot of time on the bench, Calvin Phillips, which isn't ideal. I think the other point with him is this. It's the Jack Grealish problem. Jack Grealish has admitted this. I mean, at Aston Villa, he was a big fish, like Calvin Phillips was a big fish at, at, at Leeds. Um, now he's just another player when you go to Manchester City. So Phillips has that little psychological thing, I think, to, to overcome as well. But, hey, look, they've got five subs this year. They've got a whole stack of games because they're going to have a crowd everything into the, all the midweeks going up to mid-November to get it all in ahead of the World Cup. So I think they're all going to get enough minutes when push comes to shove. Mark, let's talk about another transfer uh, in the transfer mill and all those rumours. Tyler Adams to Leeds. What more can you tell us about this? Well, Leeds are pretty confident this will get done. Maybe 18, 20 million pounds. It's, it's another American player after, after signing Aronson. So, you know, Jesse Marsh has been given the chance to to rebuild at Leeds. And, you know, it's a good sign. He's a Champions League player, uh, a regular for the US. Decent fee. So I think it's a good bit of business by Leeds. I, I still think they need to, you know, find a bit more quality all over the pitch. But, you know, for that sort of money, 18 to 20 million pounds, it, it's a really good deal. And I think, you know, he'll play a lot of games. And it, it's a chance for him to, you know, use Leeds as stepping stone. Leeds are a big club, but, you know, it could go further. Let me go to Mr. Gogo USA. What do you think? Is this a good move for Adams and Leeds? Well, they're going to be the club, aren't they? Certainly the fans in the United States are going to be looking at with an American manager, Aronson, uh, the US <laughs> international in the World Cup squad, has been signed as well. Tyler Adams, I mean, I've seen him since he came through. He's a lad from New York State. Um, he's a busy player. I think he's an excellent addition to their squad. But, you know, they've lost Phillips and they've lost Rafinha, so they need to get some high-quality players as well in there now. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be, I think, a, a tight thing again for Leeds this season if they don't. At least, Tyler, at, least at, at least, if we can... Uh... At least if Leeds get relegated, we can blame the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that, Craig. All right. Well, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk. You know, there's going to be a lot of talk about it because already we have, you know, we've had the following of, of, of Jesse Marsh, who did a pretty good job in keeping them up. But as Ian said, you know, when you lose real quality players, uh, Rafinha, there's a reason all those clubs wanted him. And Calvin Phillips, I think, yeah, I think pretty much most teams around Europe would have taken. Calvin Phillips, and when you lose those players, it's, it's it's not going to be easy. So I could see another, yeah. I mean, it's all right bringing in players that you know from different leagues, but I could see this at the moment losing the players that they have being a very tough uh, season for Leeds United, unfortunately. Tyler Adams to Leeds. What are your thoughts on it? Well, it's it's a question of love, really. When you think about the lack of love that there was from Tedesco and Tyler Adams at Leipzig, so he became exposed. And Jesse Mars, and let's not forget about the relationship between Jesse Mars and Tyler Adams going all the way back to the New York Red Bulls. It became an obvious choice, I think, for both Jesse Mars and Tyler Adams. That relationship has grown over the years, and for Tyler Adams now becomes an opportunity to go into a team in which he's going to have an opportunity to play or at the very least compete I don't think he was going to get that opportunity at Leipzig because the manager in place, Tedesco, had said mm, he's not part of the plans. So I think it was a necessary move for Tyler Adams and for the U.S. men's national team. We'll no doubt have more transfer talk on the show tomorrow. We do hope you can fit us in to your plans. ESPN FC available seven days a week. Join us again tomorrow. I cannot tell you how excited we are. Just days away from the opening game of the Women's Euros as we take a look at the odds. Many saying that there are a few favourites in this one, but as you can see, standing out there at the top of the pile is Spain. England, the hosts, just behind them as we now welcome in Gemma Soler, who will be on the coverage for ESPN during the Women's Euros. Ian Dark as well with us. He'll be commentating on the games. Great to have you both with us. Gemma, I want to start with you. The other day, Christina, one of our hosts here, was talking to Sidlow about Spain, and he said they've been dismissing the favourites tag. Is that true? Are they doing that to take the pressure off themselves? Or is it something that they're genuinely taking game by game, as we're hearing from the Spain camp? 
Well, okay, yeah, that's true what Sid uh, said. They, they don't want that much pressure. And I think it's fair enough because they are seventh in the ranking and they don't have in the history a huge success to, to go there to the heroes and say, okay, you are the, the, the favorites. And there's another uh, aspect as well. Um, ninth of these players, they, they played for FC Barcelona last season and they truly believe they were the favorites to win the, the second Champions League in a row. And truth was that they didn't have a chance against Olympique de Lyon. So I think that they won that, that experience, that bad experience put the, the, the feet on the ground and, and they want to take uh, one step at a time. And in, in the Euros, uh, I, I, I'm not that much sure they are the, the, the absolute candidates. I think it's going to be an exciting competition because there are four or five teams very powerful. And, and I think there is a top three of uh, candidates. Yes, Spain is on there, but but we cannot forget about uh, Germany. For me, maybe the most competitive team, and and Sweden that has an amazing uh, generation of yes uh, uh, players with a lot of experience, and they can be one of the candidates as well. Uh, one thing we must talk about, though, is the fact that Spain do have Alexia Puteas, the Ballon d'Or winner, obviously the grand hope here, and all eyes will hmm. be on her. Can we talk a little bit more about her, Gemma? Yeah, she's uh, such a talented player. Uh, she, she's uh, um, she has an amazing skills. Uh, she has a is having a, a wonderful career. Twenty eight years old. Uh, and actually, in the same team, they have the, the Alexia Putellas too, who is uh, Ariana Bonmati. So I think uh, she's uh, having the, the the best two seasons of her career, and she's has so much security and such a, a good connection with the rest of the players. And she's a truly potential player that. Uh, I mean, I, I know it's very easy to compare, but she would be the, the Leo Messi of the, the former Barcelona uh, men's team. So uh, she, she, she's having a, a great season. But once again, we have to go back to that final of the Champions League. She had such a disappointment there. She couldn't play her football. Uh, she's uh, truly a, a very talented uh, player. But um, I think she had such a, a bad time in that in that final in Turin. And I think that's why the rest of the team and, and Alexia herself are taking this international competition with a lot of uh, caution, I think. Uh, let's talk about England then, if we can, Ian. Will they be under pressure given the fact that they are the host to bring it home? A little bit, yeah. There is quite a lot of excitement and expectation about this tournament. They've already sold 87,000 tickets for the final at Wembley at the end of the month. So that's going to be the biggest crowd for any men's or women's European Championship match. So that, that's the level of interest. All the England games are a sellout. They'll start with over 70,000 watching them at uh, Manchester United's ground, Old Trafford, against Austria on Wednesday. And, you know, in the prep games, they've looked good. They've looked physically strong. They play a very effective, high-pressing game. They've got two exciting wingers. They've got a goal scorer in Ellen White. And they've got a coach who led the Netherlands to the triumph um, in 2017. So, you know, there's not a lot wrong, except they've never won anything before. <laughs> so can they do it now? That's the question. Yeah, I think that's only added to the expectations as well, the fact that uh, Wiegmann is there with England. Anyway, let's talk about the dark horses in this one. If we've talked about the favourites here, being the likes of Spain and England, we've just seen some of the other names and the other teams here. And there's a fair few that could go all the way, it is really fair to say. So if it isn't Spain and it isn't England, who have you got, Gemma? Uh, I'll definitely go for Germany as a competitive team of uh, Sweden. I, I need, we cannot forget about the defending champions, uh, Netherlands. Uh, so as I was mentioning, I'll put uh, five teams there in, in that they could be the, the winners. And I think this will make a very exciting competition. For example, the Spanish uh, group stage with uh, Germany, with Finland, it's such a, a difficult uh, group. I mean, anything could happen. Yes, Spain and Germany are candidate but they can uh, have difficulties and, and don't go through so I think it's going to be such an exciting tournament. Gemma everyone's saying it could be anybody we want one for you if it isn't Spain or England you're going to say Germany? Yeah I'm go, uh, I'll go with Germany. All right what about you Ian? 
I think looking at those uh, odds, I'd say Sweden, myself. They got to the Olympic final. They were a bit unlucky not to win it, really, against Canada. Lots of experienced players like Caroline Sager there in the midfield, Aslani as well. They know their way around a tournament. I think they're going to take the world of beating. I don't think they've actually been beaten at all by anybody since that Olympic final. So they're a tough nut, I think, for anybody to crack. But they are in that same group with the Netherlands, who really weren't that impressive against England recently. But I'm told by the coach that they're going to be all right on the night. That's what he says anyway. <laughs> oh, well, we cannot wait. It is coming up on Wednesday. It all gets underway with England against Austria, kicking things off, as Ian said, up at Old Trafford in Manchester. You can watch every game live here across the network on ESPN. OK, let's continue with some of the transfer talks, some actually official news from hey. Barcelona. Frank Kessie and Andreas Christensen, both official right now with Barcelona. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about what this means for Barca this season. We will start with Kessie, um, with you as well, Ali, actually. Does he get straight into this lineup? Is that why he's been brought in? I don't think right now he gets straight in because of how magical Gabi and Pedri have been and you still have the presence of Sergio Busquets. You continue to ride Gabi and Pedri as much as you possibly can, but what this gives Xavi is options, depth. And in having that depth, then you can rotate players in and out and you can have Pedri take a break here and there so that he doesn't run himself into the ground. He has had a propensity for injuries, so it would be important now for Barcelona to get Pedri stronger. Same thing with Gabi, a player that has been so very good both for Barcelona and the Spanish national team, but in the moments in which he has a dip, now you have a player that can step in and take that role in Frank Kessie. Some people think of Frank Kessie as a, as a guy who would take Sergio Busquets' position. He's not that kind of player. He's more of a box-to-box -box guy and a guy who likes to be a presence in the attacking half, which at times is why I was very critical of Frankie de Jong, that I didn't think he played to his strength in being a presence in the attack. When he was able to be that late runner inside the 18-yard box, it made him a better player and he made Barcelona a better team. If Frank Kessie can provide that, he may just find himself into a starting level, but not just yet. And he might be the uh, leading penalty kick taker if uh, anything oh. that we saw at Milan uh, <laughs> is to be taken uh, into consideration. Gemma, let's talk about him then, because he's been identified as a player that would be coming to Barcelona for a long time. So what are the expectations from him? Yeah, we were uh, looking for the official confirmation for so many months and, and it came just uh, today. He will be wearing the jersey with the number 19. This means that Ferran Torres will change his number. We still don't know uh, which one will be he wearing. And I think, I mean, the easy uh, headline is that he could be the Yaya Toure of Xavi. What, uh, Yaya Toure was for, for Guardola. That, I, I think that's the, the easy headline. Um, he definitely brings something different, something that Xavi doesn't have in the midfield. Um, as uh, Ale was mentioning, let's not expect something that he's not. He's not a Sergio Busquets. He's not a Gabi. He's not a Pedri. He's not as maybe as sharp of, uh, as them. He's not a Frankie de Jong or a Bernardo Silva. He's an alternative. He's bringing something different. He's fast. Uh, he's uh, physical, yes, but but he's also playing good with the, with the ball. Let's not... Um, say that he's a, a defensive midfield. He's much more than, than that. Um, he's not signing to be in the start straight away, as Ale mentioned. He's signing, actually, because he's a free agent and he's a very talented player and Barcelona were looking for uh, good opportunities in the market and, and he definitely is uh, one. So let's see what, what happens with him. Uh, he needs to win his role. I think Xavi will have to work on him, on, on, on his movements and, and adjust that to to what Barcelona is and he definitely has a possibility to be in the start, in the start and to bring uh, uh, something interesting to this uh, new Barcelona. Ian, you're one of our La Liga commentators here on ESPN. Let's move on to talk about Christensen and whether you think this is a good signing for both parties. 
Well, he, he, he can be very impressive. I've seen him give a lot of cool, composed performances in the Champions League. He, I mean, you remember he came on when Chelsea won the Champions League final. I think Thiago Silva got injured and he was excellent. Um, I mean, one or two question marks against him this last season. And there was that business with him saying he didn't want to play in the cup final. Maybe that's because he knew this possible move to Barcelona was on the way. Who knows? And then it was said that there'd been other instances. They were. It was all a little bit of a mystery where he'd made it clear that perhaps he didn't want to play. So I don't know what the story is with that. I think he's a, he's a good young player. And it's a good signing. I think Cassie's a good signing. I think he, I could see him, really, you'd have to say, they kind of know Frankie de Jong's probably going to go, so they need another midfield player. So in comes Cassie as well. So, you know, maybe they're going to get Rafinha. They'll tell the fans that. Maybe they're going to get Lewandowski as well. But we were told <laughs> they were skinned. So, you know, there's a lot of financial juggling going on somewhere there. Uh, well, yeah, we just heard Frankie de Jong's name come up once again, Gemma, with Kessie coming in. What does it mean? Does that tell us something about his future? About Frankie de Jong, um, that's very difficult to say because uh, we know Barcelona has been talking, direct talks with Man United, so we thought he really was going to leave Barcelona. And now we have President Laporta saying that they want him to stay, but uh, taking a considerable pay cut. Uh, because the player himself, he always said, I don't want to go, I want to stay, I want to succeed in Barcelona. So I think Laporta is sending a double message. One to the player, yeah, if you want to stay, you can, but uh, do a consistent pay cut because his salary is going to be one of the, 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 the highest in, in the squad just uh, after the, the, the captains. Uh, so he's saying to the player, if you want to do that, take a pay cut. And he's sending a message to, to Man United. Uh, we are not that broke anymore because we did uh, some financial game. So we are not that desperate to send. If, if you want to sell, if you want Frankie de Jong, show me the money. So I think that's the double message. Uh, we will see. There are direct talks with uh, um, Man United. Xavi always said during the season, he didn't want to sell Frankie de Jong until the very last of the season that he thought maybe with Nico, with Gabi, with Pedri and with another addition, I can use this money to have something different. Uh, let's go to another player that they've been linked with, Barcelona, Gemma then. Jules Kunde from Sevilla. What more can you tell us? Yeah. He's probably the, the, the defender that uh, Xavi would like to have in, in his team. The, the thing is that the, the money, because uh, uh, Barcelona uh, did a uh, uh, bid on him about uh, 45 million. Uh, Sevilla already turned down a 50 million last season from Chelsea. Um, so so it's, it's a difficult operation, uh, money regarding to money, because for a defender that's a lot of money. When you want to get your people excited, you you want a Lewandowski, Rafinha, you want to keep Dembele, you want a Bernardo Silva, you want so many things that it looks almost uh, impossible. But I think it would be the perfect fit because uh, now I, I could listen to Ian uh, and some question marks regarding Christensen. I think Jules Koundé would, would be a player that, that could fit uh, right in. But, but the problem would be uh, uh, money related. Uh, but I'm sure he, he, he will be great for, for Barcelona because... Uh, they need options in, in the centre back because you never know with Gerard Piqué and his age, you never know with Eric Garcia, with Araujo. So he, I'm sure he would be a perfect fit. Problem is uh, with Barcelona last year, the, the money. Perfect fit for you, Jules Koundé at Barcelona LA? It's a piece that they could use. I don't go and spend all this money for him because I already have an apprentice in Ronald Araujo right next to Gerard Piqué. And we're suggesting by the publications that Barcelona has put out on social media that Gerard Piqué has been in training for the last two weeks. He'll be ready to go. He'll be the best version <laughs> of Gerard Piqué. Okay, let's assume that that's the case. And let's trust that that's the case. Then there is no space there for Jules Koundé unless you decide to play him as right back where he has played before. I don't think that's his best position. So therefore, I don't know that you go and spend all this money when you already have a second option in Christensen coming in, who is an upgrade to Clement Lenglet, by the way. Now, on all of this, the contradictions of John Laporta, and it just, it's just funny. It makes me laugh when he says, <laughs> Uh, according to Gemma, in the message that they're sending to Manchester United, we're not that broke, 
But Frankie, if you want to stay, you got to take a pay cut. We're not that broke, <laughs> but you got to take a pay cut. Well, either you're not broke or you can't pay your players. One of the two. You can't, you can't have it both ways. There is contradictions with Barcelona, and it seems to be the case with every conversation that we have in terms of players that they want to go get. We want all these names, mm, but you got to give us a discount, because others, otherwise we can't afford you. I don't know that this is the way you run a business. Uh, well, we'll, we'll know a lot more about how Barcelona's squad shapes up when La Liga returns to your screens. Not too far off now, August 12th will be back in action. Barcelona will be at the camp now against Rayo Vallecano. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Stick around, we've got extra time coming up with Ale, with Gemma and with Ian Dark as well. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. We've got Kay Murray and Ali Moreno here with you in the studio. Gemma Soler and Ian Dark with us too. Red, white and blue oh, for today, July 4th. America, baby. Like it, Ali. Very, it. very nice. Actually, I think Gemma's got a bit of red, white and blue on as well. And Ian's got a yeah. bit of red. And we call each other with Ali before. I, I didn't get the memo. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, that's OK. All right. You, you're not American, right? Not yet. Oh. <laughs> the kids are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Plus, it could be a sensitive date for. I hope it doesn't put them people off. People from England. Help him. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I'm going to go home and have a cup of tea. <laughs> All right. Let's start with uh, some of your tweets and your questions. Thanks for sending them in. Oh, you know what? I'm going to start with you, Gemma, on this one. Who does everyone think has had the better career? Hazard, Griezmann, or Neymar? Mm. That's such a difficult one. I, I cannot say they are broken prospects because they succeed, but at some point their careers stop shining. I cannot say Neymar because either himself or his dad decided to, to end it too soon. I'll go with Griezmann because he's a world champion, so probably Antoine Griezmann. All right, well, well, and we must say as well, the better career so far because they are all still so active far, players. Yeah. What about you, Ian? Yeah, that's a good argument. Yeah, World Cup. Uh, Neymar thought he was going to 2014. Um, who's the best player of the three? That had to be Neymar. But answer the question. Probably agrees. Yeah. I'm gonna say Neymar. And while he has come up short at the World Cup stage, let's not forget that in 2014 he was playing really well for Brazil, and Brazil were playing really well. We're on a good run, and then he broke his back against Colombia. And that changed sort of the, the, the direction, obviously for him, but certainly for Brazil as well. He has won Copa America, and while, and he has won Champions League as well with Barcelona. And individually, he has been a tremendous talent. The problem is that the, the last few images that we have from Neymar are not positive at all. But, the last few images we've seen from Griezmann are not positive at all. And the last few images that we've seen from Hazard, well, we haven't even seen him. So I'm going to say Neymar. I just think he is a very, very impressive talent that could have been better, should have been better and more productive. <clears throat> has probably come up short of his own expectations and our expectations. But regardless, I still think he has been, had a better career. All right. Next question for you, Ian. Phil Foden or Mason Mount? Mm. Oh, um, I love Mason Mount as a player, and Gareth Southgate does as well. I think he's just played too many games, and he's looked a little bit jaded this past year or so. But is he going to be in England's starting lineup at the World Cup? Yes, he is. Foden's a wonderful player, too. Uh, <laughs> that, this is a difficult <laughs> one. I'll go Foden. Ah, I like it. I like that you got off the fence there, Ian. I very much like it. He was right on it, though. He was right on he it. He was for a grasping moment. onto that fence. Yeah. He knew he wouldn't hey, get look, away with it. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's, the, that's what they give you. The hard questions, they're the ones that get through. For Ale, this is a nice one. Okay. This is supposedly Sergio Busquets' last season at Barcelona. Could you summarize how great he's been for Barcelona and Spain? In a team in which you had. Iniesta and you had Xavi, they would not have been nearly as successful had they not had Sergio Busquets. He is a player that understands the space around him. Not the most athletic guy and yet 
the awareness of what's around him is what separates him from the rest. His first touch away from pressure, his ability to understand the next pass and how the team evolves going forward, going through him. Imagine this, everybody who plays against Barcelona knows that the ball is gonna go to Sergio Busquets first, coming out of the back four. And yet, they're not able to stop him. And they haven't been able to stop him for over a decade. He has been outstanding, both club and country. His legs are going now, but the mind's still very much there. Yeah, uh, legacy, I think, is the nicer mm -hmm. one, hey, when it comes to Barcelona and Spain. Speaking of Spain, Gemma, what are some of your favorite venues in Spain to cover, uh, sorry, to visit while covering a football match? Well, um, of course, Bernabeu and the Camp Nou are, are probably the most impressive venues. But my two favorite venues in Spain, honestly, one, it's gone. It was the Vicente Calderón. I like all stadiums. But definitely now is the Sanchez Pizjuan. Because I love Sevilla, but that venue, that atmosphere, that arrebato song before the game, it's so special. And, and it has this kind of flavor of old football um, that it's lovely. So it's definitely the Sanchez Pizjuan. Uh, I've got to say, I've got to agree with Tremor on that one. If you're looking at going to Spain, make sure you get down there to the Sanchez Pijuana in Se uh, Sevilla. To Sir Ian Dark, mm. do you take special care of your vocal cords just like oh. professional singers? Oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should, but I don't. No, I'm, I, one of my fellow commentators told me I had to stop drinking coffee because it gets on your vocal cords, but I love drinking coffee, so I haven't done that. Um, the only thing I'd say, if you had a bad cold or something like that, you'd probably look after your voice by not speaking much a few hours before the game. But other than that, I'm probably, it's not very professional, but I don't do too much um, to, to, to look after my voice, as it were. But I've got this far. <laughs> you know, what about Ian earlier in the show today, uh -huh. quoting Coldplay lyrics? Oh, yeah. Well, you know. Ian is with it. Ian is definitely <laughs> down with the kids. Sir Ian Dark. Yeah, yeah, Sir Ian Dark is with it. Yeah, he's definitely <laughs> down with the kids. Uh, OK, tennis fans among you, who will win Wimbledon? Might be a silly question for you, hey, uh, Gemma. So I'm going to go to you, Ian. Well, I'm sitting where I'm sitting now, about six miles from the centre court at Wimbledon. So it just, it's just up the road from where I live. Um, I like going, I like watching the tennis. And uh, maybe a glass of pink for the summer evening, lovely evening. Um, to answer the question, I think you've got to go with Novak Djokovic, haven't you? Um, he's still icy, he's still at the top of his game. Takes a lot of beating at Wimbledon this year, so Djokovic for me. All right. Mm. Uh, speaking of July 4th, uh -huh. we're going to talk about hot dogs. Okay. Since the hot dog eating contest happened today, what condiments do you enjoy putting on your hot dog? Are hot dogs even popular in England or Spain? So Gemma, are hot dogs popular in Spain? Yeah, we call them Frankfurt. I don't know why, like the German city. But yeah, are very popular and I'll definitely put ketchup and mustard. And we put there some mayonnaise or onion as well. Mm. Yep, very similar to back home in England. Okay. Um, if we were back home in Venezuela, we would put everything on the hot dog. And, and I mean everything, including some radioactive sauce, because they sell these things on the street. <laughs> there is some sauce that looks a little, little green yellow tone to it that is probably not good for you, but you put it on top of it anyways. Here, I become a fan of pepper relish. And it's only because I'm here. But right. back home, it would be different. Yeah, I mean, in England, we used to eat them, but they're, they're a bit underwhelming when you can see what you can get on offer here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, they're very popular, usually with onions, mustard and ketchup, but not as good yeah. as the ones you get here. I, I, I want one of those Venezuelan ones now, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> the radioactive... I don't know what that would do for your vocal cords, though, Ian. Oh, it will take care of the vocal cords, let me tell you. It'd be go, go yeah, USA probably everywhere. Improve, probably make me better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Start, sit or sell. USA Independence Day Backyard Cookout Ooh, Edition. This is for you, Ale, obviously. Okay. Barbecue ribs, mm -hmm. burger, mm -hmm. a hot dog slash brat. Right, so this is interesting. 
Because see, barbecue ribs is like it's like that player that you know is very talented. <laughs> that you see him in training every day and say, man, this guy could do something for me on the weekend. And you trust him. You put him out there on the weekend and on the day he doesn't quite deliver. So if indeed you're gonna serve barbecue ribs, you have to be good at fixing the ribs. If you're good at fixing the ribs, then ribs are number one and everybody else comes second. But because there is inconsistency with the ribs, I'm gonna sell the ribs. Okay. And I'm gonna lean heavily, starting hot dog, benching the burger, and then the ribs. Oh, wow. Now, if you got somebody who knows how to cook barbecue ribs and, and, and does it right, a little down south action, a little southern barbecue, then I would say barbecue ribs number one. I'm wow it. Benching the burger in America. So the hot dog starts. I'll start the hot dog, yeah. With the radioactive sauce. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an international player. I'll bring the radioactive <laughs> sauce from Venezuela if we can get it through customs. And then, um, yeah, I'll do the hot dogs first, burger second. <laughs> if we can get it through customs. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, all this food for thought has uh, made us hungry, so we're going to have to end it there. Thanks so much for sending in your questions. We thank Gemma, Ian Duck, and also Ale here in the studio. Make sure to join us same time, same place tomorrow for more.